So I, I thought I'd give a little talk about our experiences of using uh, uh, Erlang in uh, blockchain development. And as you can tell, I'm on the uh, Eternity uh, core team developing uh, an open source uh, blockchain system. Now, <coughs> you often get sort of questions, why, why did you choose language X for a certain project? And as I think most of us know, the answer is pretty, usually pretty trivial. Some guy had a lot of influence and decided that this is language we're going to use. Or your bosses had a lot of influence on your language choice and you didn't really get to choose. But in general, when, when, when you're talking about what is the best language to solve a certain problem or what is the best language in general, um, I think a lot of people underestimate how much a programming language affects your thinking. And, uh, and um, so it, to me, it, it's kind of like asking what is the best language for poetry. Now, obviously, Swedish is the best language for poetry. Um, besides the fact that it's very hard to find people who actually can write poetry in Swedish or even understand it. Uh, but <coughs> anyway, it's kind of interesting when you when you look at poetry in different languages, um, how you can actually find different sort of <laughs> very quite quite a lot of difference in character, which I think is colored by the the culture and also perhaps by the by the language itself, uh, where, for example, German uh, poetry has a very distinct feel. Um, so, <clears throat> and I think of programming languages in the same way, and I actually particularly like languages that are quite opinionated, and I think Erlang is an opinionated language. It has a very uh, clear idea of what types of problems it, it wants to be good at. And, and also of how you should think when you write uh, programs in that language. And, uh, <clears throat> but of course, at, at the... Um, so I, I think, for one thing, these are sort of communicating vessels where you, uh, you bring... You pick your language... Uh, the language you think will be most suitable for the problem you have at hand. But then once you pick the language, that language also shapes you and shapes how you attack the problem. Um, <clears throat> and of course, if you learned enough languages, you will find that uh, you will find it fairly easy get to get into a new language because basically you, you, uh, you look at what is the syntax, uh, what are the semantics, uh, what is the grammar, and uh, you find that there are a lot of similarities, actually. There are superficial differences. So you can fairly, easy get into, fairly easily get into reading a language or writing code in a certain language. But in order to write good code and actually understand sort of the deeper nuances, that takes a long time. Um, and, and also, it can be difficult to translate or basically port ideas from one language to another. Uh, I don't know if uh, Kenji is here. I'm going to uh, get into deep water here. Um, this is kind of like the hello world of uh, Japanese haikus, I think. Um, and there are a lot of different uh, attempts at translating it into English. And and I can't tell which one of these actually hits the mark, or I guess it's maybe you have to read all of them to to grasp the the sense of what that actually says. And I guess in order to determine that, you have to also understand Japanese, which I don't. So 
In terms of opinionated programming languages, um, let's just start from the uh, all the way over there. You have the least opinionated programming language of all, I think, which is um, assembly. And you can't really read that, but it's I think it's uh, some assembly code to spot the uh, Pentium fdiv bug. Uh, you have uh, Fortran, which is very geared towards towards uh, expressing mathematical formulas. You have the everything is an object part that you can't see, and that's probably just as well. Um, and and here you have some uh, Erlang code, which is uh, concurrency oriented languages. And when Erlang came along. Um, there weren't that many concurrency-oriented languages uh, around. There were a couple. And, and it kind of tells you how it wants you to view the world. And um, so the, the idea in Erlang is everything is concurrent, the world is concurrent, and you want to map your problem into as many separate processes concurrent activities as the problem calls for. Preferably no more, no less. Now, <coughs> you also have the some competing requirements that you have to balance when you pick a language. You have the typical performance versus productivity trade-off, where you have some high-level languages um, that give you very concise uh, solutions to a problem, but possibly, I say possibly, at the expense of performance. Especially in micro benchmarks, you will see a very clear trade-off in performance. When you're writing complex code, the trade-off may not be as clear. But uh, then you also have some problems where you really need uh, to get down close to the metal, and perhaps also create code that can be dynamically linked into another environment. And, and there you basically are looking at C, and possibly C++ as a better version of C, but essentially C. Um, now, one thing we all often find when we develop complex systems is that languages that looked to be seemed to be much more effective when we made our early prototypes get us into trouble afterwards when we start tackling the really complex problems and then we can actually end up uh, paying a high price in terms of performance for the simplifications we had to make to stay sane during the process um, and not sort of get killed with all the bugs due to the, all the sort of low-level flexibility that we really did not want when tackling the, the bigger problem. And there, for example, um, automatic memory management and uh, garbage-collected languages can become extremely efficient uh, at a high level because uh, to to build something similar, similarly effective by hand may not even be possible. Kind of like a good compiler will usually beat your handwritten or hand-optimized code if you, um, in many languages. Now, another divide is on the concurrency side. We have a few languages that are actually concurrent by design. Uh, nowadays, there are, um, there are a couple of uh, languages that we can sort of leave to the historical archives. But uh, nowadays, I would say Erlang, Clojure, Haskell nowadays, um, Go, perhaps Rust, uh, where you actually had uh, concurrency already on the drawing board. 
with Haskell, it wasn't really the case, but it was such a well-designed language that they could actually add concurrency afterwards uh, in a very good way. But in, in most cases where you try to add concurrency to a language that wasn't concurrent from the beginning, um, it usually t doesn't turn out well. Now, I put Java here, which is perhaps a little bit... Um, uh, well, Java did have concurrency from the beginning. It was just a bad concurrency model. Um, and they ended up paying for that. And then, of course, there have been attempts to try to introduce better concurrency models in Java, but then you have competing concurrency models in the same language, which also is not good. But another thing, uh, many of the modern environments today have tried to sort of get inspired by uh, Erlang in terms of concurrency, but one thing that many of them have not uh, added is the fault tolerance uh, part. Where, for example, if you look at Go, it has, it's actually more inspired by CSP, uh, Tony Hoare's uh, communicating sequential processes, but you don't have the protection between uh, Go routines. So if a, a Go routine fails, what happens to the others if you're actually sharing memory? And this is something that was designed from the beginning into Erlang. Um, and Akka, for example, is really an Erlang clone in Scala. Cloud Haskell is an Erlang clone in, uh, in Haskell, you could say. So they, and actually one of the most difficult parts in, in designing Cloud Haskell was mimicking the exception uh, handling, the monitoring, and the, uh, the fault tolerance. And in most of the other languages, you pretty much have to, to write your own error handling, which can be arbitrarily difficult. So <coughs> that was sort of just a general intro. So in terms of blockchains, um, I would say that it's not immediately obvious that Erlang would be a good choice. Um, for one thing, um, well, one thing that actually at least speaks a little bit in favor of Erlang is that there is very little in a blockchain that is performance critical, partly because the sens consensus algorithms limit uh, scalability, at least today. So. What do you have in Bitcoin, like three transactions per second? This is not um, terribly much, uh, for, especially for a language that was actually designed for transaction systems, where you should be able to have hundreds or thousands of transactions per second. Um, but um, there are a couple of things that are very performance critical, and that's mainly the uh, proof of work, hashing, signatures, that part, uh, we do not write in Erlang. We use uh, C code for that, uh, libsodium, for example, and, uh, and a proof of work uh, component called the uh, cuckoo cycle. So then we basically spawn those off as separate Unix processes. And they're actually so uh, performance heavy that you, you can spawn off a separate task, and then it will work for quite a while before finding a solution. So it's, it actually works more uh, like a batch job. And then when you have uh, efficient NIF code for uh, hashing, signing, and, uh, and verifying the proof of work, uh, that actually works pretty well. The rest of the code is not that performance critical. Okay, state channels, but I'll get into those later. So, <clears throat> and then you have lots of networking. I don't know how many feel that they are kind of new and uh, not very knowledgeable about blockchains. Okay, so the thing about blockchain technology, that's really weird when you get into it as, a, say, an Erlang developer, is that these are essentially no trust network. You cannot trust another actor in a system. 
So you, you rely on the mathematics to establish trust. Basically, you trust what you can prove. Um, so then when you talk about consensus algorithms, scalability, all kinds of things like that, you know, you might think as an Erlang dev that, yeah, I know that stuff, you know, leader election, yeah, I've worked on that for many years, actually, I've written leader election algorithms, but none of those work in the blockchain space because you actually trust all the participants um, that you're uh, locking algorithms, leader election algorithms, all kinds of synchronization algorithms, all of them depend on all the actors actually behaving when you're talking to them, you're they are supposed to comply with the protocol. And you don't, if the normal uh, assumption is that if you have some actor that you're talking to in your cluster, then it's actually there, there is an evil actor that is there to destroy you, all bets are off. This is sort of the Erlang. Uh, credo. We don't have sandboxing. If you get to run code in my VM, there is no protection. Um, so then, basically, you you design a protective shell, saying no one gets to get into my uh, cluster except through the ports that I open to the outside world, and that lock there that is, or the door that is locked and has a bodyguard out, or um, armed guard outside or whatever is required to establish a security perimeter for your system. Um, and the blockchain world is entirely different. Uh, for that reason, for example, we don't use distributed Erlang. There is, it just doesn't have um, a place in the blockchain world. But there is a lot of networking. So, but the way you network is essentially you will just do broadcast to the world. You have a bunch of nodes connected. You, you share the entire blockchain because you can't really trust, or it's hard to trust someone with only a part of the blockchain. Uh, there are. Uh, there is work on sharding, and there are a couple of sharding. I, I, I'm not going to say that they're not working. It's kind of ongoing research. And um, so, <clears throat> if you have a network with, say, a thousand nodes or ten thousand nodes, and you have to talk to everyone, you need pretty um, uh, performant networking support, and you need to be able to have tons of connections open, or be able to open and close connections very quickly. Um, and this is an area where uh, Erlang fits very well, obviously. And another thing about blockchains is that it really is a moving target. Uh, all the uh, sort of investment uh, hysteria aside, um, it's very interesting technology. It's probably revolutionary. It's probably going to revolutionize a bunch of different areas, but it's kind of hard to say exactly how right now. But for a programmer, that's kind of a dig here signal. This is interesting. Let's, let's develop it and see if it destroys the world or makes it better. But that's, that's for later. That's kind of how we work, right? So. I think Erlang helps in areas where requirements are not that well defined because it's a very dynamic language, it's a high level language. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to tell you what it says so you don't have to stand up or stretch your necks. Um, <clears throat> Erlang is really designed uh, for loosely coupled components. Uh, and this is a way to stay, in, stay sane when you write very complex, uh, large complex tele, tele, uh, telecom systems, which are expected to live for many years and evolve over time, where different components evolve in, in, in different ways. So we see um, that 
parallel development is, is reasonably simple. Reuse is very simple. We have a high degree of re reuse in the Erlang community. It's pretty easy to um, bring in components from the open source world, notwithstanding that documentation sometimes is non-existent, especially in my components. Um, and, um, but again, back to the opinionated uh, characteristic of the language, it, it kind of nudges people into writing code in the same way. So normally if you get into a third party component that you want to reuse, it's not that hard to write, read the code and figure out what it does or to get into supporting it. And they all use OTP in the same way pretty much, so it's pretty easy to plug them in and, um, and run with them. And also, I would say, the focus on backward compatibility in, in the Erlang OTP world, like you heard from Kenneth uh, just now, also help helps that APIs are pretty stable. There is really a culture for handling backward compatibility and respecting that components should actually live for many years and, and work. And you, you can't just break everything with the next new release of the language. So <coughs> the concurrency, it says down here, the part that you can't see, concurrency done right. Um, so <coughs> concurrency in, in Erlang, how many of you are not Erlang programmers? None of you. So yeah, I uh, just so I know which level to, uh, to put, uh, place myself at. Uh, as you know, concurrency ha is kind of a structuring principle in Erlang, much like object orientation is in some other, uh, some other languages. This is how you structure your code um, and how you also come up with loosely compon uh, coupled components. And uh, I think we, we find that this really helps us uh, divide into different tasks and work in parallel and actually have um, have the system be fairly stable. All, all the way at the bottom, which you can't see, is complex state machine support. This is something that I uh, we've added a bit of late as we got into implementing state channels. So I'll talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit more later. Um, testing. The functional language approach, as you probably also experienced yourself, is that if you have purely functional, uh, uh, if you have referentially transparent functions and you test them, especially if you test them using something like QuickCheck, you often have the, um, it often has the characteristic that at the beginning, you find a bunch of bugs and you correct them and you correct them and then basically it all goes silent and you've pretty much found all the bugs and then that code stays correct until the requirements change. And this is something we also saw uh, already in the big er Ericsson projects that I was involved in in uh, the late 90s and early 20s uh, that that we had a pretty low number of bugs compared to similar systems already from the beginning. But then the co bug density tended to go down because code that we had actually corrected early stayed correct. So it was basically, we ended up having fewer and fewer, there was this, uh, I think by normal industrial standards, extremely demanding requirement for bug density. I'm not sure if I'm still allowed to say what it is. It was confidential, but it's, it's very low. Uh, much lower than the, uh, what is it? Uh, 
Is it, even, is it one bug per thousand lines of code or something that's considered good in industry? This was more than a, a magnitude, order of magnitude lower than that. And we were below that um, even from the beginning. And then we reduced it by yet another order of magnitude almost over time, adding features. Uh, for every release, the bug count went down. So <clears throat> this, was, this is a very interesting characteristic, and it certainly simplifies testing, that once you've really tested your code, it tends to stay correct. Now, other things down there, it says carrier class product mentality. It's kind of nice when you're working with, especially when you're working on a moving target, uh, immature technology, to know that your core technology, for example, the VM, is rock solid. You don't have to worry about that tripping you up as well. So then you can deal with the things that are really supposed to move, or the, the uh, your own uh, unstable code. But also, it says down there, no dependency hell. I think this is... Okay, we can talk about Rebar 3's uh, dependency handling, which is better than Rebar 2's dependency handling. But as with many things, you can actually do fairly well with uh, pretty uh, crappy tools in Erlang because um, the language itself doesn't pose such challenges that you have to have world-class tools to, uh, to stay afloat. And another thing with the networking support, since uh, you have the automatic memory management. You don't. You don't have. You're not sensitive to buffer overflow bugs, things like that. Many of the normal attack vectors on the networking side are not really possible in Erlang. Or if they are possible, it's they have to attack kernel code, and that that code is usually uh, extremely solid. So, and you can see that, for example, if you look at um, web server advi uh, security advisories. The, the Erlang-based web servers usually have quite few security advisories. Um, and usually when uh, there are some, it's usually at the H HTML level and not at the networking level. So do we have any challenges? Well, one thing is that since very few other blockchain projects use Erlang, there is very little code that we can just steal. Um, we have, for example, stolen some code that was written in Go. Uh, we ended up having to port it, and then we ended up having to write, rewrite it anyway because it didn't actually solve the problem the right way. But um, we don't really get that much reuse from the blockchain uh, world since we're using a reasonably a rare language. That is a slight problem. Um, and some people want to run blockchain code on your phone and um, or on their phone, and uh, then of course you can't use Erlang on on iOS or Android, and uh, well, that's potentially a problem. I wouldn't say recruiting has been much of a problem. If you look at our core team, I think it's pretty well stocked with. Uh, experienced uh, uh, Erlang programmers. So <clears throat> I'm going to say a little bit about state channels in Erlang. So for those of you who are not so familiar with blockchains, you, um, I did mention that performance is not the blockchain world's forte. It, it actually is quite expensive to commit stuff to the blockchain. You can view the blockchain as, a, as an immutable append-only database, if you want, uh, where each write is extremely heavy. So <clears throat> state channels, that's an idea um, where you basically negotiate a session between two peers, 
and you have an initial blockchain transaction where you load tokens into this channel, and then you can transfer tokens back and forth um, very quickly and cheaply because you don't ha have to hit the chain every time. So it's kind of amortized uh, cost. And then you have to hit the chain again when you close it down. So <clears throat> think of it as your, for example, your coffee shop app, which you loaded with your credit card, and then you can just you scan the QR code when you buy a coffee. Um, that that type of use case. So it's kind of a trust but verify um, mentality in the state channel. You're you're co-signing all the transactions so that you can verify that you you have the same idea of of your state and everything, and that you agree on every update. But if something goes wrong, you just basically uh, abort the channel, and and then, then you have dispute resolution on the chain, and that's heavy and uh, very costly. So ideally, you will end the, the channel by a mutual close where you have a co-signed view of the channel state, and then you commit that to the chain, and, and all is bliss. So we did something that we hope will simplify for the app developers. Um, we decided that we're going to have provide a blockchain node where all the nasty state machine stuff ends up on that node. And then as an application developer, you have a WebSocket interface where basically you say, I want to open a channel to, to that guy over there. And then much of the interaction is the chain will tell you or the channel FSM will tell you, OK, here is something for you to sign. And you, you check it, you sign it, and you send it back. And then perhaps, I want to transfer some tokens. OK, sign this. And then you hand that back. That's hopefully simpler than implementing the entire state machine. The thing is, though, that really messes things up on the state machine side. Because suddenly, here is a little uh, sequence diagram where you start by a request from the client saying, I want to transfer some tokens, an amount from this public key to that public key. Uh, and then you send a message back saying, OK, sign this. This is my the transaction state that you want to sign, which with these instructions and, and a reference to the previous state and everything. But then you enter a wait state or a transition state, since signing if you, this was actually the client, then signing is an atomic operation. But now suddenly it isn't, because I have to send a question over the WebSocket to say, can you sign this? And then I have to wait for a signature. And then once that comes in, I, have, I can send an update to the other side, and it s sends that to its client and say, OK, sign this. And then it has to wait for a signature to come back before it can send a reply to the other side. And these transition states, that's where insanity uh, creeps into state machine development. Because if something else happens there, while I'm waiting for, for example, that signed message, what am I supposed to do? And exactly what can happen while I'm waiting for this? This is where you enter go-to programming. I gave a talk about that at the Erlang User Conference 2005 and later uh, at uh, GoTo, I think it was 2010. So here is a link. You can, you can uh, watch that presentation. It was called Death by Accidental Complexity, and where I argued that when you have state machines that look kind of like this, they talk in multiple directions at the same time. And these incoming events are not coordinated in any fashion. So essentially, you have to handle all possible permutations of state event com combinations that can happen, unless you have some kind of selective message reception, where you can say, in this state, I want to see only these events. Any other event, just leave them in the message queue. I'll deal with them later. 
um, on, and I, I did some experiments in that uh, in that presentation to show in practice how that can play out. So in Erlang, in the old, if you say textbook Erlang, then you know every function, the state is your function name and then you can do a receive clause and you can do selective message reception and it's all beautiful. Nobody does it like that because you want OTP support. So then there was a, an OTP behavior called GenFSM didn't support selective message reception. So it was basically the uh, run to completion, first in, um, first out uh, semantics that could lead to very, very nasty uh, code. Now there is a new behavior, and there is going to be talk by Raimo later today, um, the gen state M. This is what we decided to use, and it actually supports uh, selective message reception. So, <coughs> the schematic basically of the state channels, this is where Erlang starts paying off. For every channel, and we can potentially have thousands, I've only tried with 400 so far, but um, I think we can definitely support thousands of simultaneous channels on one node. So here you would have the state channel Finite state machine, uh, WebSocket handler, which is a cowboy callback uh, where you talk to the client. Here is uh, the networking session handler. We're using a protocol called Noise, um, which is an encrypted protocol on top of TCP. And for people who have seen my talks before, this essentially works like a middleman too. It does the encoding and decoding of messages and sends normalized messages to the state machine, where basically this is the message and here is the map with the different values. So it's a lot, you don't have to do the decoding and stuff here. You can actually pattern match on the messages, which makes it a lot easier. So then essentially you have, and then you spawn a process when, when you need to, that watches the chain so that you can see that well, you've had enough blocks pile onto your transaction so that you actually trust that it's not going to get kicked off the chain, for example. So this is where Erlang gives you a very, very nice structuring of the problem. Now I'm going to hit you with code, even though it said basic at the um, in the schedule. But this is kind of what the code will look like in the gen state M. You have the for example, a waiting signature transition state where you pattern match on basically saying, I was waiting for, uh, for a signature on the, here it's a withdrawal, and then I add some signatures, and then I send a message, and then I start that watch chain watcher, for example, and then I go into the next state. And... Um, Pattern matching here makes it very easy to just assert that this was really the message I was looking for. Um, but here, this is where you do the selective receive, and you can't see that in the back. You'll have to watch the video or uh, see the PDF, where you can actually get some other messages. I pattern match on them because they are valid or kind of expected. Um, but then I just do postpone, and then the gen state M behavior will kind of withdraw, and then it will dispatch those messages in the next state. So I'm just basically saying, okay, yeah, I know those can end up here, but I don't care about them here. You could have a sort of a catch-all as well, where you say, okay, any any event that comes in here, let's just postpone it because I don't even want to think about how it works here. And then after the terminating dot there, if there is anything that is not in this uh, sequence of clauses, then everything aborts and all those other processes will also abort because they're all linked and then you have the Erlang style failure handling. So I would say, you know, not 
this regarding why Erlang was chosen in the beginning for eternity, I don't really know. Somebody wanted to try it, I guess. It's actually working out well. And, um, and it, it does shape the way we structure the code and, um, and um, how we attack problems. And I think Erlang actually works very well in this, uh, in this domain. And especially when we get into the complex state machine programming, it's a lifesaver. And I will also say that this was actually the first time I've, I've dealt with uh, Gen State M. And I think it worked well. It was a bit weird in the beginning and took some time to understand how, how to use it. But it's well worth the effort. And I think there is, there is really no reason to go any other route if you're going to do state machine programming in Erlang.